I'm going to try to get through my stuff in about 15 minutes. I'm going to see if I'm doing it. Hello everyone, welcome to the Zhang Legacy Collection Center where we're here to celebrate the launch of Kristen Tracy and David Small's new book, The Cat's Very Good Day. Um, we're happy to host this, particularly because this is where we hold the David Small and Sarah Stewart archive, and we're always proud to be able to be a participant in their new events and new ventures. With that being said, I'm gonna hand this off to Kristen, and let her uh, take charge. Thank you so much, Sue. <laughs> we're so excited to be here today. Um, I actually got my PhD at Western Michigan University in English and poetry. And so I have known David since that time because David used to be neighbors with Stu Dybeck. I don't know if anybody remembers that name. And so Stu and David were neighbors and Stu was on my dissertation committee. And I told him, I said, I like poetry, but I also like children's books. He's like, you should meet David Small. And I'm like, oh yeah, I should. And they set up a lunch for us for sushi. And I went and I sat and David never arrived. And I was like, I was just crushed. I was like, oh man. And I, I emailed him afterwards and I'm like, David, um, I, I missed you at sushi. And he wrote, oh yeah, I, I didn't go. And then, <laughs> and um, he said, you know, you really, when you have lunch dates with people, you should email them the day before <laughs> and remind them to come. And I'm like, oh yeah, I should do that. And he's like, to make it up to you, why don't you come out to my studio? I'll give you a tour. You can meet my wife. You can see her gardens. And an amazing friendship was born. And from that moment on, I decided, like, bad things don't happen to me. Like, things happen that aren't great, and then they turn into better things, mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of been, like, how I've, I've lived my life. So that's how I know David. And I'm going to talk a little bit about writing for children in the digital age. We'll read the book, and then David's going to talk about illustrating um, in the digital age, which I hope all of you are curious about. So um, this is my cat, Bunny. And the whole book is about Bunny. And I like to say words are more than words. Now, Bunny is a rescue cat from Kalamazoo. He grew up um, when he was a little kitten in a trailer park, and somebody sporadically fed him out of a can. And uh, Frost, Robert Frost Scholar at Western adopted him, but then uh, traveled to Japan, and somebody needed to take care of Bunny until he could get back or perhaps smuggle Bunny into the country. And neither of those things happened, and I ended up being Bunny's owner for 15 years. The reason I say words are more than words is I don't know if any of you have been following that chat GPT the artificial intelligence generating um, stories, language, all kinds of things. So what I decided to do was I decided to put in this, um, this chat, the instructions to write a picture book about a cat. And it gave me the first four lines. Once upon a time in a cozy little house lived a curious cat, quiet as a mouse, with eyes so bright and fur so sleek she'd spend her days taking long cat naps and peek. 
I mean, it really doesn't mean anything to me. It feels very empty. And I thought, well, you know, my cat's from the perspective of a cat. Maybe I need to add that into my request. So I put in, you know, write a picture book about a cat from the cat's point of view. And I got this. I am a feline, sleek and sly, with piercing eyes that catch the eye. My fur is soft, my purr is loud. I am a cat proud and endowed. <laughs> Which is um, terrible, right? <laughs> and I started to think about what you know, technology is attempting to do here and failing at. And I realized that um, so much of the story that I wrote about Bunny and that David illustrated is based on the experiences that I've had with my cat. Sue. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so how important is experience? Yeah, again. This is Bunny. 90% of the story exists because I watched my cat do stuff daily for 15 years. <laughs> Did I love my cat? Yes. Does the story feel more authentic because I spent 15 years observing my cat? Yes. What's the point? <laughs> Lean into experience. I have been writing for you know, over 20 years. And the thing that I find that connects most to other people is when I'm really leaning into my own experience. And that is something that only gets to be more true the older I get. When I lived in San Francisco, I used to walk past these raccoons every day in Golden Gate Park. I saw them over a thousand times, right? And I, they would look at me and I would wonder about them. And I never fed them, but sometimes I watched other people like break all the park rules and feed them. Years later, I got um, an email from my agent and she said to me, she's like, there's an illustrator in Canada who does woodcut illustrations who wants um, somebody to tell stories about her animals. And I was shown a picture of a bear, a hare, a turtle, a moose, and a raccoon, right? And I looked at that raccoon and I connected with it. And the reason I connected with that raccoon is because the amount of time that that raccoon had already lived in my head, right? And so if I just sort of picked up any animal and tried to write a story, I don't know that it would have been very good. But I picked up, picked up an animal that actually meant something to me, right? And, and, and this is the story. It's I am picky. My son is a very picky eater, right? And so I feel like that's also something that, that, that weaves itself into it. And that's something that I actively look for in my own life now, is um, ways that the story can intersect with my own experience. Um, so I really got into this, plugging things into the GPT chat, as you can all tell now. So I asked it to write four cat picture books, and I gave it the names Sandra Boynton, who, if any of you know, are very playful, right? Mac Barnett, you know, again, like a quirky writer, but, you know, adventure prone. Kristen Tracy, you know, because that's me, and then Stephen King, which seemed like, you know, all fair. So this peekaboo peekaboo who's hiding here just for you, it's a cow with spots of black peekaboo. There she is peeking back. Or is it a pig with a curly tail? Peekaboo, I see you without fail. Maybe it's a sheep with wool so white. Peekaboo, you found her. What a sight. All right. So that's its knockoff attempt at Sandra Boynton. And then I have just included like a little bit of one of my son's favorite stories. A cow says moo, a sheep says ba. Three singing pigs say la, la, la. No, no, you say, that isn't right. The pigs say oink all day and night. Rhinoceros is snorting snuff. And three little dogs go rough, rough, rough. And I mean, you can just feel the animation, right? And the authenticity in the voice that is Sandra and not the voice that is this AI that is mined and tried to do a pretty good job, like trying to, you know, talk about animals at least, right, in a rhyming way. So then what happened is um, the adventures of Captain Catnip, I think you can kind of tell, well, that's probably the Mac Barnett voice. Once upon a time in a cozy little house, there lived a cat named Captain Catnip. Captain Captain was not an ordinary cat. She was a hero. She had superpowers and went on amazing adventures. One day, Captain Catnip received a mysterious message from a group of kittens. The message said that the kittens were in trouble and needed Captain Catnip's help. Without hesitation, Captain Catnip set out to rescue them. 
the flatness and just kind of this summarized um, story is nothing like a Mac Barnett story. And I was so appalled upon reading this. Um, my editor is um, for a, a book I have coming out about a girl and her cat who swap bodies this summer. It's called Don't Trust the Cat, a book I was born to write. So his, um, Mac's wife is, is my editor. So I sent it to Taylor and I said, Taylor, look at this. And I also sent her the one that I had, it had done for me, which is this, The Curious Cat. Once upon a time in a small house on the edge of town, there lived a curious cat named Cleo. Cleo was always exploring and investigating the world around her. One day Cleo saw a butterfly fluttering in a breeze outside her window. She'd never seen a butterfly before and was curious about what it was. She watched as it flew around the flowers in the garden and then it was gone. Cleo knew she had to find out more about butterflies, so she set out on an adventure to discover everything she could about these fascinating creatures, right? Um, my editor was appalled by this as a reflection of me and was appalled as the other as a reflection for Matt. And the idea that, um, that these are so absent of any um, life or authenticity or joy, right? Or that kind of uh, experience, right? So this is what it said for Stephen King. I'm sorry, I cannot fulfill this request. <laughs> Stephen King is known for his horror and suspense novels and it would not be appropriate to create a children's picture book in his style. Is there anything else I can assist you with? But really, I mean, there's a lot of good kind of picture books that border on horror, whether it's creepy carrots or various things. You know, this chat could have done a cat picture book in the voice of Stephen King, you know, had it have tried maybe. Um, I have a friend who writes screenplays. She wrote um, the Pixar movie Inside Out and she was plugging in things and she was trying to get it to write a screenplay with a strong heroine right, who um, doesn't need to be rescued. And it broke the GPG chat. It refused to do it as well, right? Because all of the examples it had to build a romance, it didn't have that. And so it just stopped. And she's like, I couldn't get it to build it. So we live in an age where we can easily document our experiences and you can, you can, um, can you use this technology to generate stories, right? Because I used to write in a time before iPhones and before all these other things. And I have to say, going back and looking at those pictures of raccoons um, was a helpful thing for me when I built that book with Erin, right? I even sent her that picture of the raccoons. And I, I do think that there's something about the way we can document our lives now that is helpful in recovering those kinds of experiences. So here are some pictures of my son. I have not put him in these stories yet, but he wanted to be um, the, um, not Big Ben, but the... Elizabeth Tower. Elizabeth Tower. And so I dressed him as that. Once I gave him a bread heart that I just thought he'd hold up for the picture and he ate the whole thing. And another time he, he fed a porcupine, right? These are all things that are in my imagination. And one day I can imagine writing a story about a kid who wants to be buildings, right? I can imagine writing a story about a kid who will only eat bread shaped like weird things or something about a porcupine, right? I store these now and they're things that I can return to. I don't have to always keep it in my head, though I do keep it a little bit there. The other thing um, is I used to be a volunteer gardener on Alcatraz. For many years, I helped restore the historic gardens there. And so when I look at these things and I save it, I can see the guard tower that was uh, rebuilt um, during the, the filming of um, the, um, no, it was not the Birdman. It was the Nick Cage one, The Rock. So there's only one authentic leg to it, and then the top tiles are authentic, right? I can see Building 64. I can see the Sally part. I can see it all, and this is inside of the prison uh, where I actually got to spend the night once with my husband. <laughs> and see, these are the gardens that we restored, right? And I look at that bird and I take that picture sometimes into schools and I show them that bird. And I say, you know, you look at that bird and you see a seagull, but I look at that bird and I can see the cages. I'm sure Sarah can see this too, the cage over the geraniums. Mm -hmm. And you can see the poop and you know that that bird is gonna destroy those flowers, right? And you can start to build the story. The other thing is there's a dot on its beak and I, and I started doing research on that. I'm like, why does it have it? And the babies, tap it to be fed, right? And the mom knows to feed it. But they've done um, extensive um, stories. There was a scientist who, who took that, a biologist, 
and studied it to see if that was instinct or if it was learned. And he ended up winning a Nobel Prize because everybody had always said that it was a learned behavior and it was not. It turns out it's instinctual, right? And these are the kinds of things that I tell these first graders when I bring in this bird and I say, you know, you have to be curious about these things, right? And you're just, you're, you're cataloging all these experiences, all these things. And because of the way we live now, you can kind of take them with you, right? This is um, a hedgehog, you know, and I'm from Idaho. So I was just home visiting once and I took that picture. It's where the luggage goes around, right? But again, like you can capture things and hold them, you know, and you get to take them into the world, into your writing. And those are the things that I think that um, technology can be really helpful with. So when I look at those, um, those chat GPT things, like it hasn't had these catalog, catalog of experiences that we have. Right? And so if there's a way to use technology, I'd say, let's do it. So how does my storytelling benefit from the digital age? I can research quickly. I can save um, and return to ideas. I can revise aggressively and save old drafts. I can return to documented moments in my life through photos for inspiration and research. I can use my phone as a research tool. I spent um, many days in the archives in San Francisco, and if you go into the notes um, of your phone, you can turn it into a scanner, and you can scan documents and then put them up on your computer. I recorded audio interviews with experts, and um, I can interact with my lived experiences in different ways. So the question I like to end on is, how can the digital age help you tell your stories, right? With David and I, it really came out of my cat. And then when I had these rhymes, like I reached towards David and I sent David the manuscript and he was like, yeah, it's a real cat story you've got there. <laughs> and he agreed to illustrate it. And that's kind of how that happened. All right, now I'd like to read um, Cat's Very Good Day for you. And then David's gonna um, provide some, you know, brilliant observations about this. He's the best. Cat's very good day. Sunrise lounger, piano key pounder. Dollhouse fiddler, <coughs> toilet bowl dribbler. Mirror attacker, morning tea whacker, what a lovely day. Sock drawer slinker, keyboard tinkerer. <coughs> Potted plant disaster, acrobat master. Vacuum avoider, sofa destroyer, what a happy day. <laughs> Tightrope walker, neighborhood stalker. Baby squirrel chaser, mama squirrel facer. Rooftop runner, welcome that sunner, what a wild day. Fishbowl tapper, shoebox napper, bottle cap flicker, full body liquor, hamster ball snagger, hairball gagger, what a busy day, windowsill bounder, big moon sounder, dark storm warrior, back closet scurrier, curled up loner, scaredy cat groaner, what a stressful day. Bedtime sneaker, warm pillow seeker. Half asleep schemer, stretched out dreamer. Moonlight cuddler, all night snuggler. What a very good day. Um, well, I've got to uh, say something before we go on with my formal remarks. One of the glories that I've found of uh, working digitally is something that I've been striving for uh, as an artist, as an illustrator for decades, which is the use of really 
saturated color like that page. That wonderful butterscotch color in the background. Can't get that with watercolor really well. Was that a signal for me? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, doesn't show on these slides. These are... So, for example, another example. Um, let's see, where are we? What a busy day. The colors in this book tell as much of the story as the action of the, of the figures. Or at least they set, a, they're, they're, they set important moods. So this is evening, the storm, going from this sort of calm green into this deep purple. You can get uh, wonderful watercolor effects, but you can also get really flat color. Probably something I uh, developed a taste for in Disney movies when I was a kid. Yeah. You remember those days when you only went to the movies once a, once a year and it was usually a Disney movie, right? Yeah, it was, and these nighttime scenes, look at the color in these. These are, uh, these are effects, light effects, color effects that I would have died to have when I was working in watercolor. This is going to be sort of a... Um, a pitch for digital art, <laughs> which I would never find myself doing 10 years ago. I never would have even considered it. Uh, I, my, my, uh, my astrological sign says that I'm a bit of a fanatic, and that's true. And I used to be fanatically against digital art. Now it's sort of the, uh, the opposite. By the way, I've just had throat surgery. Uh, I was gonna wear my scarf wrapped around my neck to hide the scar, but what the hell. Uh, it was all ill-timed. I talked about it with my doctors. I said, uh, I want a, I want a strong, I was losing my voice. And uh, I said, I want a strong voice for this book tour that's coming up. My doctor thought a book tour meant sitting at a table and signing books. So he said, wait for it, and we did it. And this is the result. Three weeks later, I said, I have a worse voice than I had before the surgery. So I apologize for that. Um, after decades of uh, being an editorial artist and a book illustrator, using traditional techniques, because of time pressures imposed on artists in publishing, I became more and more interested in the idea of learning digital art. If, as promised, it would speed up my production in some way, make it easier to uh, make corrections. Uh, little, if, when you're working in an analog way, pen and ink, watercolor, uh, for reproduction, the smallest uh, mistakes uh, can either ruin a, a work of art and make you have to start all over again, or put you through the laborious process of cutting uh, little tiny patches, they're called. Um, uh, something that reproduces the mistake in a way that can be photographed without the edges showing and it'll look in the final reproduction like a, like a, like it all, always belonged there. Um, so I thought if this was going to be eliminated in any way, it would be worth it. I began lessons, uh, Photoshop lessons, in year one of the, of the pandemic when our, all of our time began to stretch out in a more, let's say, leisurely way, uh, even though it drove all of us crazy. For some of us, as artists, it was good. Writers, too, I suppose, in some ways. It took me back to the old days when you could do a drawing and live with it for a couple of, for a month, you know, instead of having to get it into the New Yorker in an hour, you know. They send you the, they send you the story at 11 o'clock and say, I need it by three. <laughs> really, it's crazy. $200, wonderful work. Uh, 
since uh, everything came to a halt for a time in New York, um, while editors and art directors learned to work from home, uh, I had plenty of time to get down to the basics of Photoshop and apply them in a limited way to the book that I was working on currently. About a year later, my good teacher introduced me to the iPad and the program that I now use, which is called Procreate. This uh, latest picture book um, was done completely in Procreate. And with that, because Procreate incorporates and improves on all of the qualities I learned in Photoshop, and especially because drawing on this thing is so much easier and more natural than it was with a clumsy Wacom, Wacom tablet, however you pronounce it, uh, where there's a total disconnect between what you're doing with your line and your hand and the screen, uh, I became a hopeless addict. My background in printmaking helped me. Uh, it helped me step into the, into the digital techniques with no problem because, as in all printmaking techniques, etching, lithography, woodcut, serigraphy, or silkscreen, it's about layering images. It's really image upon image upon image to get one reproducible image, a layer cake of <coughs> pictures. This is also um, similar to the way that I always worked as an illustrator. I always used a light box, which allowed me to first make uh, rough sketches and then to define them by tracing, to refine them by tracing. Um, I remember the joyous day I went to the Detroit Art Museum and saw an exhibit of the drawings of Edgar Degas, my hero, and realized that he, his, his, his sketchbooks were full of tracing paper. He would do a rough sketch, trace it, refine it, trace that, refine that, until he got what he wanted. Well, this is much the same thing, except it's done digitally. What's different about that kind of technique on paper and this kind of technique on, a, on an iPad is the ease and cleanliness with which underlayers can be done away with once they've outworn their usefulness. I've got a, we live out in the country and in my backyard there's an iron burn barrel which for uh, years has been smoking and flaming with all of the preparatory sketches that I've thrown away. I know this drives Sue Stoyer, <laughs> my archivist, crazy, but in fact, if I didn't burn them, I would never have been able to get in the studio. Oh, look, there's a deer out there. A deer. A deer. A deer. Oh, this is animal night. You haven't heard <laughs> They're around a lot here, aren't they? Yeah. yeah, so now with digital art, there's no more burn barrel polluting the air. There's also no more messy fingers, no more uh, art supplies all over my shirts and pants, uh, no ink spills and splatters on the rug, no dust drifting from the pastel chalk into my lungs. All of these are pluses. The range of brushes, inks, pencil points, colors, textures, all available in this program with touch of a button ridiculously impressive. Ridiculous because I never use 95% of them. Uh, impressive too is the ability to alter the size and placement of a, a figure, a building, uh, an entire landscape uh, to increase, increase or uh, enhance the sense of spatial perspective. Uh, so too in changing the colors instantly. Uh, making overall improvements to the design rapidly. Everything is easy, quick to accomplish. I think I should add to that, if you're an experienced artist. Um, I could, that's another discussion now, uh, which we can have, by the way, during the q and A. I I have opinions. As for its use in kid lit, the children's literature, the making of a picture book, the illustrating of a picture book, is a complex process that could take the years of experience to perfect. Uh, 
There are no magical digital buttons to make you learn it. Yeah. My studio still, which I hardly ever go into anymore, uh, still has in it a, a wall-sized corkboard, which used to be covered with drawings, which would equate, if they were all up on, if the whole corkboard was filled with drawings, it would equate maybe half of the book I was working on. The whole point of putting them up, up there being to see the book all at once, uh, so that you can map the uh, progress of the art from one page to page, checking for things like sameness in the characters, uh, variety in the layouts, proper changes of visual rhythm according to the needs of the text, and the flow of the action that's important from, from spread to spread over the course of 42 pages, which is the length of a normal picture book. Now, by means of a spreadsheet on a screen on the iPad, I can see the entire book at a glance. No more need for a wall. I must say, in conclusion, I do miss the feel of the pen and pencil on paper, a sense of touch involved in using old-fashioned art materials. And I also believe that the, the word I would use is valor involved in drawing and painting as opposed to the ever-forgivingness of digital art making is a serious loss. The use of traditional takes is like a tightrope walking without, it's like tightrope walk, walking without a net underneath. It requires bravery, nerve, guts, spirit, grit. I'm glad I grew up on that, learned on that, tried and sometimes succeeded at that. Above all, I'm glad that the way that I use it my digital art attempts still display evidence of the human hand at work. Et voila, I got through it. Well, it. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Kristen or me? Anybody about anything? As you're drawing, are you going back and forth with Kristen to say, is this the look you wanted at this scene? Is this the background color you wanted on that scene? Doesn't, doesn't do it that way. Uh, not that specific about the art, because as far as I know, uh, unless she's been drawing behind my back, <laughs> Kristen's talents are verbal. Uh, I don't think I ever disputed any of that. Uh, we did have black back and forth. So normally, they like to keep you in separate rooms. And yeah. so the illustrator... In separate countries. Yeah, I mean, they really... They, I mean, normally I wouldn't have David's email. I wouldn't have any contact with David. But what happened this time um, is I sold the text without an illustrator attached. And they didn't attach anybody. And I started selling other books. And I was like, hey, you know, what about this book? And so I reached out to David. And he said, send it. And I sent it. And it just so happened that the art director at the house that had purchased the book liked David quite a bit, and it just instantly, they were like, yes. And so David and I had this kind of connection, and then as we were building it, there would be times when they wanted to get rid of the dollhouse fiddler scene, my editor did. And so I would just email oh. David. I emailed you about this, and I said, David, they want to get rid of the dollhouse fiddler scene. They're thinking maybe like pancake fiddler or something like, and they're like, we have a tea whacker already. We do not need any more food. Like, you know, we need to keep the dollhouse scene. Was this after, excuse me, was this after I had made sketches? Because oh, yeah. That, because that's a kind of a dangerous picture, you know. It should, I know. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was after by, by, sent, you've done your stuff. And then we were oh. supposed to be like, oh, yeah, it's done. And so then you were like, I like it. And I'm like, oh, we'll keep it, you know? And so it was, then David started sending me art at the same time he was sending it to the art director. And I would tell him what I thought. And we built the book out, like very, like we were naughty. Like, you're we, not supposed to do that. We made our own book. And we really kind of made the book we wanted to, to make. And I feel like there was a lot of like, there was there was back and forth in a way that's very um, unconventional for any way I've ever built yeah. another book. Same here. I I don't think 
I had one book where I had a lot of contact with the author afterwards. It was a, a book I did with Sarah Weeks. Okay. But it was after the book was done. Yeah. And uh, this was so unusual. I mean, at so one good. point, we, we said to ourselves, we've created a back channel. And then we, <laughs> we just kind of went with it, you yeah. know? Which, you know, in, in a way was nice for the art director, whom I had worked with before. Right. Um, because her strength is color. Yeah. And that was her main concern. Uh, as an editorial art director, she's not, she's okay. Right. But uh, I think it, you know, kind of, it was a nice balance, as it turned out. Yeah. Since we didn't really have an editor, did we? I mean, we really, we really built the book. Yeah. You know, and um, yeah, we won't say cruel things. But when I first when I sold the book, it was not cats very good day. It was all the things, and it was like the cat just kind of saying, "I'm all the things," and then they wanted a different refrain line, and and I mean, it just was like finding it. But like I think we really found all that stuff kind of together, just building it out and figuring out what we wanted the cat to do, and you know. I I don't know. I feel like so much of the substance, the of the humor, the. Uh, the cleverness of the text is it, it just seemed to tumble out of you there was never any if i said i felt uncomfortable with uh, anything if i ever did i because i must have because i i remember these instant solutions that you would come up with or instant within just a couple of days but you were like you were bold too in that um it wasn't shoebox napper it was um small box napper or something like that and then you were like well, i think the shoebox is better and so you just changed it and sent it to me and it was right but um it's like that's kind of how we built the book and you said you did it but you did <laughs> <laughs> yeah we did uh, yes right. but you said at the kia a few years ago and i've never so i was it's shocking you said that to me. Uh, that you said you had a, an author that was starting out the whole relationship and telling you what to do. And you were very, um, uh, well, you said quite clearly what you thought about that. Yeah, that was a different, um, that was, uh, she was actually a very good friend of ours, but she'd won a Newbery at one point in her life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, she was, she had a need for control in her picture books that some artists respond to, and I didn't. I like to be left on my own. Uh, I mean, you know, if a text is good, it calls up pictures in anybody's mind. And I didn't want two single space pages per line to tell me exactly what what should be in the picture, where this character ought to be, what he ought to be doing. I don't care. For, that's not collaboration for me. I mean, it's not. I thought that, to me, hearing you say that was just a beautiful thing, really, mm. because it was because you are an artist. And, and a storyteller. Yes, right. On, and you, and you know how they go together. Yeah. And I did kind of like her story. <laughs> I wanted to do it more because she was my friend and I needed something to do at that time. But uh, with, the, with those directives, I just couldn't right. continue. And it altered our friendship, too. So it was sort of a, a learning experience in many ways. I'm just going to say, I think David and I are better friends now than when we started. I think, <laughs> the book. <laughs> I think it went well. Sue, did you have a question? I was going to ask you, did you find it satisfying, and do you think you would work together again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, uh, David's great, you know. David, David's great because he is so narrative in how he sees things, and, you know, he, he, you know he's easy to communicate with, and, um, I, yeah, I love, I love David. I think he's great. That, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Your prejudice. <laughs> and he I also does some nice small details as well. I mean, there's a lot of little details that are just really fun. And and it's all he was super accommodating. It's like when he was doing the dollhouse scene. I used to have a dollhouse when I was a kid, and I was like, you know what? I think young readers would love is if we put like a miniature version of the cat in there in that picture, and like he would just do it, you know? Like he didn't push back. Like he was like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> can you put that up on the screen? Uh, I can. 
Which one? The dollhouse? Dollhouse Fiddler. I have to go back. Give me a second. Is it? Oh, there's a book. Yeah, it's a book. She turned it on and just has to take it a second. Rather than a pale, washed-out version on the screen, here's a, <laughs> a miniature one of it. Uh, can you see it? I say it's wicked because by today's standards, uh, I have no problem with wokeism at all. Uh, but uh, everything is being fiddled with in a terrible way. I mean, look at what they're doing to Roald Dahl. Uh, did you read the Times article? I mean, it's incredible. They've got it to Mark Twain. Why not Roald Dahl? Yeah, and Shakespeare. Yeah. Any, anybody's game. They put it up. Oh, yeah. So speaking of color, you talked about how much you enjoy using the palettes in, in uh, Create. Did you have a problem when you were working in watercolors with the way they were being reproduced in the final book? Sometimes. Uh, it only from my own ignorance of printing dilemmas. Uh, this uh, our director on this book, t who is very good in color, uh, taught me that you need to keep things at least above six percent in terms of saturation to make it visible in the book. Otherwise, there's a, a problem that it's going to wash out completely. Um, yeah, so there is that problem. I guess any time a color thing gets reproduced. Do you see yourself going back to traditional art as opposed to digital at all? You know, I feel... Uh, I like being exhibited. Uh, I like being in gallery walls or museums when it happens. And that's, that's the digital stuff is sort of spelling the end of that. Isn't that true, Sue, to a certain extent? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I thought my voice was radiating out of this <laughs> post. I know, it, it, it only goes... <laughs> yeah. Go um, I was asked if I missed doing mm -hmm. uh, original art, you know, yeah. with analog techniques. And I said, that I feel sorry for gallery owners and museum people mm -hmm. displaying art nowadays. If it's all digital, you get nothing but a print on the wall. And if people know there's a, that it's a print, they feel there's something inauthentic about it. Well, uh, as a, from the archival perspective, I'm not sure, because we haven't done enough of your files, if we're going to be able to have all the layers you know, where we could actually see stages of the drawing. Because yeah. you know how the, the, one of the interesting things from an archival perspective is when we back up David's digital art, you know, how, how rich is that going to be in terms of what we can preserve and what could be reconstructed if people wanted to, like, analyze your process. Which you can do from the archival because we have lots of sketches along the way. Um, so it's, it's going to be, it's new territory for us as well yeah. to be preserving the art in this way. Yeah, well, I guess, I don't know, is my answer to that question. I don't know what I'm going to do. But you're happy with the digital um, experience and I am. results. I am, yeah. Uh, it, it's so easy to make changes. It's so easy to, to, not to mask, but to completely eliminate your mistakes in one part of a book uh, or picture and go on to to finish it without having to start all over again. And I know my wife is uh, writhing in discomfort because I've always said, and I mean it, it always gets better when you have to redo it. But, you know, it's a trade-off. It also shows the human struggle in a different way. When the old way of doing things and you see something old is shown. Yeah. I guess so. Your own development, you mentioned it better. Yeah. It tells more about the human hand making the art. Well, one of the things, if I may yeah. dominate this conversation <laughs> for a while, um, the, guy, uh, 
the young man who became my mentor, teacher for digital art, his name is Christopher Chafe Hensley, and uh, known as Chafe. And uh, Chafe's an old hand of digital stuff. He used to work down at the library and uh, do a lot of he did a lot of things for publication. So his guy, he's got all these techniques at his fingertips. And he had worked for uh, a while on my website and had diddled around with my art and sort of absorbed the way that I like to do things, present things. And so when we began our lessons in digital art, he understood immediately that he could dis dispense with all the stuff that he started with in every class that he ever taught. All of the basic stuff um, that would be thrown out to a group of students who might pluck from it what they wanted, but that he felt was necessary just to give an overall kind of view of the, of the whole process. But with me, I said to him the first time, I said, look, I'm not interested in this and that and this and that. I want to get my drawings to look the way I draw and, uh, and my colors to be applied that way too. And so we just started on those things that interested me, which is a great way to learn something, you know. Um, and, uh, and it's worked, I think. I think this looks like my art from other books. Uh, and I think that has everything to do with what you said, sir, about the evidence of the human hand. Uh, may not be as sketchy as some things I've done, but... Uh, yes? Uh, Kristen? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to ask, like, if someone is interested in um, getting into writing children's books, what is the way to start? You know, there's an organization that when I was at Western, I joined, and Michigan has a great chapter, the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And I joined that, and I, I joined a critique group. And so at the same time I was working on my poetry at Western, I would go on Saturdays, I think we met at the Barnes & Noble, and we would, they, they just knew a lot. They knew a lot more about children's writing than I did. And then I started teaching a course for, um, education, it was um, a survey of children's literature course for Western, and I just picked so many books to read, and reading the Newberries, reading the Caldecotts, reading all of these books that were being, um, you know, awarded and seen, helped me kind of figure out, oh, this is what's happening in children's literature, this is, this is what I should do. And then once I kind of knew how to build books, the first um, book I sold um, was a book called Lost It, and that's for teenagers, and it's about a girl who loses her virginity underneath a canoe. Because I, I kept reading these, these losing your virginity stories, and they were just like so like, like bleak, and I'm like, oh, I, I, want, I want something else. And so I wrote a funny one, and then I wrote Camille McPhee Fell Under the Bus, which my friends teased me, like you're just writing books about women un underneath unusual objects. Uh. <laughs> but uh, it was based on the time I fell underneath my own school bus, and, and I just kind of told the story of kind of growing up. And I've always heard the first book you write is always the most autobiographical, and Camille McPhee was the first book I was working on. It was in short stories. And so that's kind of what I did. But I had to really read deeply and figure out, like, what's the genre? Like, who am I? What's, what, what's this? Because your voice really, you know, is going to drive a lot of what you do. And figuring out your voice is kind of like a, a process of seeing who am I like, who am I drawn to, what am I not like, right? Uh, my husband, who's here, is a, is a writer, Brian Evanson, who writes a lot of horror and detective, like video games. And he's like, I mean, he's just a very different guy, you know? Like, um, people, you know, who, who read his stuff, it's, it's a very different room, you know? And so that would be what I would say is to look into that group and to really start reading deeply. And because one of the things someone told me is like, when you go into a bookstore, you should know where you should be able to find your book that you're writing, and I think that that's really true. Yeah. But I have to say, poetry, too, is my way into writing, and that was the thing that I love most. And I guess maybe three years ago, I won the Emily Dickinson First Book Award from the Poetry Foundation, and that was really, I mean, the fact, my agent at that point, after I won that, she's like, if you've ever wanted to write picture books, now's your moment, you know? <laughs> she's like, you'll get a lot of attention. And so that is when I wrote this, and I wrote the raccoon book, and I've got, you know, more books, you know, coming out um, in picture books. And so it really is, you know, it, it took me a while to break into the picture book thing, because it is hard. They're expensive books to make, 
and people have already published a cat book, right? Like you're competing against their own list, like a lot of times when they buy another cat book. And so it's just a really tricky space. Our book is different. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Those other books don't have cats throwing up their hairballs. <laughs> or, you know, attacking a, a hamster, hamster ball. I have to say, um, David Small did not know what a, a hamster ball was. <laughs> and, um, he was he was very like aggressively did not want to draw it, and he didn't tell me this until after he'd drawn it. And then he's like, "Well, when I looked it up, it was <laughs> I could see the appeal." <laughs> oh, it is a real hamster. And it's... So yeah. And also, my cats don't have big manga eyes, which is different, I think, from. The reviewers have already commented on how wonderful your eyes are and that the pupils are in different spots for every illustration. Like, you've already, they, they love that about you, so. I have to tell you something. I wish, in a way, I wish I had seen those pictures of your cat, Bunny. Oh. Uh, because we have a cat named Benny. Uh-huh. Who is his twin. Really? Right? Right. Sir? Uh, and this evening, uh, marks the, I think, the end of two solid weeks of cat experience in my life, which also has to do with that kind of connection. Yeah. Uh, this is sort of morbid, folks, but Benny was a good hunter. He and his brother, Winnie, live outside, and uh, Benny was the stronger, the bigger, uh, the huskier, and... Uh, Turns out the, the more adventurous, although we didn't know it, he, he had sort, sort of a passive personality. But he went over to another part of the property where we had been setting, where our, our uh, helper Stan had been setting traps for woodchucks and catching them and killing them because they were destroying my, my, my studio house, chewing at the foundation. and. Uh, he caught woodchucks, raccoons, a possum, and, uh, and Benny. Mm -hmm. Benny got his toes caught in the, in the thing, and Stan, when he found him, he let, it, let me open the trap, and Benny shot under the studio house. I couldn't hear him. I couldn't entice him out with any food. And he was gone for three weeks, so I assumed that he was either dead or had been taken by one of the predators that hang around our place. Uh, a week ago, I went to the studio, was in the back, I'm usually in the front, and I heard him, and uh, he and I had a dialogue, <laughs> sort of desperation and, and longing and hope, and uh, all in meows, and, uh, and I found a way of getting him out. And he, a feral cat, climbed into my arms, and uh, I took him to the doctor, and unfortunately they said he had to lose his leg. Uh, it was dead, and uh, Sarah and I didn't hesitate. We just gave her the permission to do it. And so for the last week, Benny has been in my studio, confined to the kitchen, but so drugged up he doesn't care, <laughs> and uh, healing. Uh, so that's one thing. My cat in this book, I mean the cat in this book, was my first cat. Was, uh, his name was Jules. I was eight years old. And Jules is that, is that cat. And Jules had no voice. Mm. When he opened his mouth, it was just... <laughs> so there's wow. that parallel, too, with me tonight. <laughs> uh, and that's all the same. But, I, but Ben, oh, did I mention that Benny is the twin? I did. That's the funny, twin yeah. of Bunny. I would have made him look like that. No, you wouldn't have. Really? I think I would have. I thought you picked this, and I was like, OK, he's going to have my personality, but he's going to look like David's cat. <laughs> <laughs> One of many, many cats. I've had many, many, yeah. many cats. No, because it goes to that place, too, that you had mentioned earlier about how much information, you know, I can't tell David, you know, make the book about my cat, you know, make him look like, that. that's like overstepping, you know? It's yeah. called, when you give a note to a, a, a illustrator, it's called a parenthetical note, right? And, and, and I've always told to not have any in your book, but that's not true. You have some. And so, um, 
you know, I, you, you have to be spare, but... If it's something to explain, something like a hamster ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's fair. Somebody once said it this way, like, don't tell me what's on the mantelpiece. Yeah. You know? And that's <laughs> true. You can't tell someone what's on the mantelpiece. That's good. <clears throat> Anything else, folks? You know, I, I just have to say, talking about digital art tonight, I feel a little, I felt a little hesitant because I feel, I know there's a class here and that you were obliged to come, some of you, which I used to hate as an art student. <laughs> <laughs> but I also know that if you're digital artists, you probably know a hell of a lot more than I do about about digital art. Are printmakers? Are you printmakers? That's a good where to good place to start. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way of starting. Do you yeah. find yourself drawn more to digital art or analog art just for fun, for relaxation? Um. I don't know. I, it's sort of a toss-up. Uh, I'm really, uh, when I say that I'm an addict to this now, it, I think it's because of the speed and the, the way you can make repairs so quickly. Uh, but it also takes away that, that uh, kind of brave thing, which is frightening. You know, the, the, the the tightrope walker without a, without, a, without a net, which I experienced every time when I would open my sketchbook in public, for example, to draw a crowd of people or or whatever. Uh, there's that, you know, there's the, that abyss that you're going to waste a whole spread of paper, or um, or maybe it's your last sheet in the sketchbook. You know, uh, you won't capture it. You won't make a good picture. There's always that kind of fright underneath draw, just drawing, period. I think it's really healthy, as I said in my uh, closing statement. I think it's really necessary to start that and to not have it so easy. And yet, I love having it easy. I've been drawing for like a long, long time. And uh, it's a nice change, in a way. You still carry a sketchbook, David? I'm afraid I, I carry it, but I don't do much in it anymore. One of the things you should know about the archive is we have 30, 40 years of David's sketchbooks of places they've been and things they've done. And that's a tremendous record of their life and of historical things that they've been a part of, which is part of the reason we have the archive here. And if, I would hope that you continue to record things that happen to you as an archivist. <laughs> when you, when you uh, work in creativity on your iPad and you decide that sketch is no good and you erase it, is it still there? A trace? Yeah. I mean, is it still oh, in digital art? Yeah. Uh, not unless I've saved it in, a, in another file. Maybe. Yeah, so maybe it's up to me. Yeah, no, it's like the burn barrel. You know, things are gone. Some things are gone forever. Just all, all those people who so enjoy peeling back the layers on oil paint to see what, you know, <laughs> what Vermeer actually wanted to paint first and had to change. It's gone. Pretty much. Yeah, it's in the it's in the atmosphere. Uh, guilty. No. Yeah. I, I, I think you might be surprised to discover the longevity of erased digital files. Really? <laughs> really. Unless you liberally write over them, they're still uh, there somewhere. Have to do something about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kristen, I, yeah, there's a question at the back. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm curious. I also use Procreate, and one of my favorite features on the app is the ability to go back and watch your drawings or video from start to finish. Do you ever make use of that feature? You know, I saw somebody do that, and I I think I learned how to do it, but then I haven't used it. Um, so no, I don't know how to do it, I, because I don't, um, 
you know, I learned, I have learned, picked up some techniques from Chase that uh, are really fascinating, but I don't need them, really. So, and I tend to forget things uh, fast if I don't if I don't have any real use for them. But yeah, that was a that was a really interesting feature. It was like all the drawings that you had done, preced, you know, preceding the final work. You can see almost like an animated film, right? It's quite a, quite amazing. And there are other amazing things. You know, when I stopped teaching, I uh, I thought, well, I'll be one of the last, the old dinosaurs who can draw. And I was taking my cues mostly from New Yorker covers, which for a while were execrable, just horrible. And uh, because nobody seemed to have any technique, they had lots of ardor, but no technique. That's changed. And a lot of the things that are done digitally now are, are absolutely beautiful. But they're not, they, they usually don't have that quality of hand, the hand. And to me, that's, that's what's important. That's where the personality of the artist comes through in the drawing. And, uh, and that, that seems to be an element that I need somehow. Could you rephrase that? Well, um, do you think in the future, as um, picture books come more and more um, published, would you have to transfer to the digital art, or would you, can there still a spot for the hand um, analog pictures? I think there's always a spot for it. I see it in children's books. Um, although digital art is dominating, just like so many things go to extremes, so many movements nowadays go fast to an extreme and dominate for a while, and you think, well, the world's changing. I'll vote for Trump. You know. uh, um, I, I don't think it's ever going to go back the way it was, but I think I think there's room for both. Here's an interesting fact, though. Um, I'm working on a, a, a new graphic novel, and it's going to be published by Norton. And they don't accept, they, and I'm told many, many publishers no longer accept actual original art. There's too much at risk in the handling and the insurance paid for mailing original art. Uh, and that's a real heart stopper, you know, when you've been working for, in my case, two years on a book, and then you put it in the mail and trust to FedEx or whoever that it's going to get to New York. And I know uh, story, horror stories like uh, William Steig, an entire book of his was lost in the mail. Uh, it's the mail system. So they just don't take it anymore. It all has to be done digitally, transferred digitally. Interesting. But it's for a physically printed book. And are there still going to be a lot of physically printed books, or is your writing and your imagery going to end up digitally reproduced as the final copy? I mean, there's always going to be the digital version. But what I've heard is that uh, in children's books, it's, 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 it's not adopting this like adult books in that um, digital space. Like there, there's just a lot of kids like the physical books, parents like the physical books, grandparents like the physical books. You know, that's what you can't show up at a baby gift shower and say, I downloaded something for you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, they like the, they like the board books. And so, and, and a question back to what you were saying about digital versus um, the old fashioned, like right now I have, you know, I'm working with that woodcut artist and she goes out, she chops down trees in Canada and carves everything and inks it and rolls it, presses it on the paper. And I'm working with another illustrator who does everything by collage and, and mixed media and she cuts everything up. And so I just think that there's just like a variety of ways that people are making these books, you know, and, and I feel really lucky about all the wealth. So she would have to, but she would have to send. Oh, she doesn't send originals. No, no, no. no. That part is, is, you know, she makes 
scans. Scans. And yeah. then she does this big um, ritual where she takes all of the woodcuts into her backyard. She burns them. Really? Yeah. Like, and then that makes me sad because I'm like, you should send them to me because like I could just keep them. <laughs> like I want them, like, I know. and I'm, I'm building up the courage to write her to ask her to send like some of the wood because I just I can't believe that she burns them. Ask her. She I know, burns. I know. Because and plus I go to schools and talk a lot. And they'd love to see that, you know. Yeah. I could pass it around. I so. have a question for you. Does the style of the art in your stories have an impact on your writing in some way? Do you think? How do you mean? I mean, when you're, and I know you got to collaborate with David much more closely than yeah. you normally would, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, knowing that this is going to be wood um, prints, uh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. does, does, does that somehow change, do you think it makes a difference to you as you write? So it's, every illustrator is different, and Erin, who lives in Canada, thinks I'm super funny. And so I give her lots of parenthetical notes because she likes my jokes, right? <laughs> and so, and she's like, oh yeah, I showed this to my friend and um, she asked, like if I came up with it, I'm like, oh no, that one was a Kristen brain. Like her brain did that one. Mm -hmm. And so it just depends. There was this one book I sent out. Um, it's coming out, I think in two years. It's a true story about these beavers that um, were overtaking this town in Idaho in the 40s. And so Fish and Game, this guy who was really smart, um, decided to capture them and parachute drop them in these boxes into this roadless area because he tried to do move them on horses and they would die because you have to water them all the time. You can only move them in the summer. And so it's this true story. And I was really just, I loved it. And so I, I sent it out and it looked like, you know, it was going to go to auction. Lots of people were interested. Random House bought it and that she was trying to find an illustrator and she sent it to this guy right? And I only had like six parenthetical notes in the whole book. I was super careful. And one of the things is, and I had a parenthetical note about the beavers and talk, and talking about them. And I'm like, you know, they're, you know, we're just um, destroying the construction and doing this and doing that. And they were troublesome. And the, and like the guy didn't even want to illustrate the book, but he wrote a note for me. And he's like, you know, tell her that, you know, we don't need to know that the beavers are troublesome. And, you know, and I was just like, and I can't believe that my editor like forwarded it on to me. And I'm like, oh man, like, you know, you know, kill the patriarchy. What's happening here? And then um, it ended up going with another, you know, illustrator, this um, woman, um, Luisa um, Uribe, um, who's from Central America. And like, I love her stuff. But it was like this weird moment where I felt like somebody was really pushing back hard on something that I thought was an incredibly neutral note, you know? Um, I know a lot about beavers. I know a lot about Idaho. I knew a lot about this story. And he, like, he just, like, you know. Boom, Maybe boom. he didn't like beavers, really. I don't know. It just was weird because if he was going to pass on the book, I'm like, why do you want a stamp of, like, you know, how you do it? But, you know. This is probably I should not be trash talking like random people in libraries. <laughs> you know? Maybe that's not like the best like thing to be doing in life. I passed on a book once. Yeah. Uh, because it was about a worm. Oh, David. And I didn't oh, think story. I could that I could draw a worm with with any verve. <laughs> David didn't just pass on this book once. I think you passed on it four times. Holly really wanted you to do it. It was called Diary of a Worm. He didn't do it. And Harry Bliss became a millionaire because he illustrated it. Yeah. No, that was a big that was a big book, David. <laughs> no, but I can remember you telling me you were passing on it at the time. It was a long time ago. It was, yeah. 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 Well, it's now a major T V show as well. But you know. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Starring who? Um, the spider and the worm. You, oh. you, they, they moved on to another insect as well. Um, uh, all right, this was great, you guys. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I think we're going to stay around and sign if you um, want us to sign books. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.